Hello and welcome to this lecture on dietary supplements. When we start out learning about dietary supplements, it's important to learn about the fact that there really is very little regulation regarding dietary supplements in the United States. Prior to 1994, there was actually no legislation. But in 1994, a bill was passed that's called the Deshay Act, the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. And the intention of Deshay was to rein in some of the supplement manufacturers who had previously had no regulation. But as you'll see, what it ended up doing was really creating an industry that to this day remains largely unregulated. So we'll start with some history. Part of the point of Deshay in 1994 was to establish a definition for what constituted a supplement. A supplement is defined as something that bears or contains one or more of the following a vitamin, a mineral, an herb or another botanical, or an amino acid, or any dietary substance that is created and intended to supplement the diet, which could be an extract or a combination of any of the first four ingredients in this list. Now, with Deshay, Deshay is and supplements fall under the jurisdiction of the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and herbal remedies had previously been considered foods. But as of a result of this legislation, they were moved into a new category called supplements. And um, due to a number of different loopholes, the Deshay Act essentially ended up restraining the FDA from being able to regulate supplements as tightly as they could drugs and other food additives. One thing you may find interesting to learn is that manufacturers of supplements do not have to provide or prove, rather, that a supplement is safe before selling it. However, they do have to prove it is unsafe before they prevent its sale. So you and I could go into business tomorrow if we wanted to, open up a supplement company, spit in a capsule, call it, you know, whatever antioxidant, et cetera, we wanted to. And unless we started killing people or enough people got sick from our supplement, there's really no proof we would have to give ahead of time if there was a similarly existing product already on the market that showed our product was safe. And it would only be if we hurt or killed a lot of people that the FDA would even come after us. Additionally, Deshay set up the situation whereby manufacturers do not have to provide scientific proof of any of their claims. So they tend to take liberties and make claims that may not be substantiated. However, manufacturers are not supposed to state that a product is meant to diagnose, treat, or prevent or cure a disease. Although, of course, there's lots of language all over the packaging that indicates exactly that. Uh, manufacturers can make indirect suggestions through what they call structure function provisions. And so those are statements that are put on the front of the package that basically imply a correlation between disease and the supplement. This has created a multi-billion dollar industry that virtually has no regulation. In the United States, you can market a supplement if there's a history of that supplement's use or other evidence that it is expected to be reasonably safe when used under recommended conditions. Products have to be labeled as a dietary supplement and have to contain a supplement facts panel. And I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. If there's any reference to health on the supplement, as there is with most of them, it has to say somewhere in bold type, this statement has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. The product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. Although, of course, many of those items are being sold to you under the auspices that they will do just that, even though there's a disclaimer saying they won't. Here's a picture of a dietary supplements, supplements facts panel. The requirements on the supplement packaging is that the product has to state its name, a description of its product, any nutrient claims if the product makes criteria, and then the contents or the weight. The dose can be determined by the manufacturer, and then the name, the quantity per tablet, and the percent daily value for all the nutrients are listed. Nutrients without a daily value may be listed below. We live in an era where if people see 100% of the daily value, they think that's good, but if they see 1,000, they think that that must be 10 times better. You as a student of nutrition, however, know that in high doses, certain nutrients, if taken in excess, especially from supplements, can cause toxicity conditions. And so going 10 times over the RDA is actually not recommended. Further down, all of the ingredients have to be listed on the label, but not necessarily in the ingredient list or in any descending order of predominance. Ingredients named in the supplement facts do not need to be repeated here, which makes it confusing for consumers to learn exactly what is in the product and certainly how much of that. And then, of course, the name and the address of the manufacturer have to be listed as well. A couple of tips for you for considerations before use. If you do utilize dietary supplements, keep in mind that the term natural means nothing. You can put all natural on any product that's highly synthetic. There's no definition for natural. 
Sometimes products cost more because they're perceived to be natural, but again, natural means nothing. Some other terms that mean nothing are things like prescription strength, high potency, or one of my favorites, which is pharmacy grade. Now, this is an over-the-counter product, so calling it pharmacy grade is rather ludicrous. None of those terms mean anything. They're just sales gimmicks to try to get you to buy more products. These products, well, for the most part, supplements can be harmless. There are certainly conditions where supplements can be harmful in the sense that some of them act like drugs, they are metabolized in the liver, and can be toxic. Pregnant and nursing women are advised to take caution with herbals because little is known about how much and whether or not they cross the placenta. Keep in mind that active ingredients in the amounts are often unknown. You'll watch a brief clip on dietary supplements from a documentary and you'll see that oftentimes supplement manufacturers hide behind the term proprietary information. They say this is a proprietary information and I can't or I don't have to disclose exactly what's in there. Also, these supplements are oftentimes contraindicated with some prescription drugs. Lots of older people who take medication need to be careful about what supplements they take because that may undo the effect of their prescription drug. And then, of course, there always exists the concern for contamination and possibly fake ingredients used in supplements, although, to be honest, across the board, that's really not a widespread public health concern. As far as supplement safety goes, it's wise to choose brands that you recognize from a nationally recognized brand. Companies like Costco and Walgreens and Target, GNC, they've got more to lose, and they're more likely, as a big established company, to have better standards of control for supplements. Try to choose as close to 100% of the daily value for the nutrients as possible. Don't go to 1,000 or 10,000%. And especially when choosing a multivitamin, that's a good rule of thumb. Get as close to 100% DV as you can. Consider the fact that fortified foods will add additional nutrients, and then know what the UL is, the upper limit, and stay away from it. You should avoid ingredients that have or new supplements that have superfluous ingredients, things like PABA, um, hesperidin complex, inositol, bee pollen, and lecithins. These are things that are not required in the diet, as is something like L-tryptophan or even very high doses of beta carotene or fish oils. You can always check the FDA website, too, to see which products have recently been recalled. It's kind of an interesting experiment to do because you'll see products that you might actually recognize. And then things like, for example, maybe they're containing some traces of prescription drugs, which of course an over-the-counter supplement is not supposed to, or other products that have been contaminated or are making really outlandish claims that the FDA is telling them they need to cease and desist. Another good tip is to look for the USP symbol. If you're choosing supplements on the packaging, you may find the USP symbol. USP is a United States non-biased third-party certifier of supplements. They claim that they're an independent science-based organization. And they do testing to look for things like the strength, the quality, and the purity of different supplements. They look at information on the packaging, as well as the labeling, and they study the speed of dissolution, as well as the acceptable length of storage. If a product doesn't have a USP label, it doesn't mean it's not safe. And again, this is not government regulated, it's independent and third party, but for the most part, you can trust that a supplement is safe if it contains the USP product. Now, as far as if you're taking way too much of it, or if you're taking it in conjunction with medications that you shouldn't, um, there are certainly things that could lead to harm, even if there is a USP label. So who needs a supplement? There's definitely cases whereby certain people do need a supplement. And the supplement should be thought of as just as that, a supplement to the diet. You should try to get all of your nutrients from foods if you can. But if you can't, here's some examples of a couple of situations whereby a person might need a supplement. Pregnant women need additional folic acid to help prevent against neural tube defects, so they take prenatal vitamins that contain folic acid, as well as other vitamins and minerals. People over age 50 oftentimes start making less gastric secretions, which means less intrinsic factor when they're digesting foods, and because your body requires intrinsic factor in order to promote vitamin B12 absorption, they may need to take additional B12. People who are at risk for osteoporosis should consider taking supplements like calcium and vitamin D, Vegans have to take vitamin B12 and may also consider taking calcium, D, iron, and zinc. For newborns, newborns are often given a dose of prophylactic vitamin K. Vitamin K helps promote blood clotting, and when they're born, their gut is sterile, so they don't have any of the good bacteria that make vitamin K, like we as adults do. So giving a shot of that early on in life helps them make the bacteria so in the event if they had some sort of horrible bleeding disease, they would actually be able to clot their own blood. If you have limited milk intake, then things like vitamin D and calcium are wise to take. If you're on a really crazy low-fat diet, you might not be getting enough plant oils. Plant oils are the best sources of vitamin E, so you may need to supplement there. Although, to be honest, it's very, very rare to actually need a vitamin E supplement. 
Older infants who live in municipal areas where the water is not fluoridated may benefit from taking a fluoride supplement. And then anyone that has lactose intolerance should also, intolerance should also continue, consider taking calcium and vitamin D. I want to close with just a couple, two more things, a slide that shows a couple of supplements that do no harm. There's plenty of supplements out there that are not harmful. Many are just a waste of money. Um, and some, of course, in very high doses can be harmful, even in lower doses, especially if you're taking other medications or certain foods. So some examples of some supplements that do no harm. Ginger. Ginger's been used for generations for nausea, stomach aches, and for helping people that have diarrhea. Flaxseed can be useful for hot flashes. It's used as a laxative and heart disease. Aloe is used to treat burns, surgical wounds, and low blood sugar. It, it actually brings blood sugar down rather, so you should be careful if you have diabetes because it can cause blood sugar to actually go too low. And then garlic as a supplement has been shown to help reduce cholesterol, reduce risk of atherosclerosis, and has a questionable role on hypertension. The last thing I want you to do is click this link for a YouTube video to watch a very brief clip from the documentary Bigger, Stronger, Faster. If you've seen this documentary, then you might know it's about steroids. If you haven't, it's a great um, kind of oversight into steroids. It's available on Netflix. But there's a really good couple of minute segment in there where the producers of the movie show you just how easy it is to make and sell a fake supplement. So go ahead and watch that to kind of get an oversight about really the lack of regulation in the dietary supplement industry in the United States.